God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And the footnote says, I am who I am, it can also be I am what I am, or I will be what I will be. Hmm. Greetings, fellow snowflakes. Um, today on Kim to Sex the Bible, I will be looking at the Exodus story and the whole Moses thing. Um, the whole remainder of the uh, Torah or Pentateuch um, <coughs> having done Genesis already it's now time to look at the Exodus story so I'm sure you probably already know this story but I'll go over it briefly anyway um, <coughs> there was a decree by the Pharaoh that um, all the uh, Hebrew children should be killed so um, Moses mother put him in a basket in the river and he got picked up by an Egyptian woman who raised him as her own and so he was raised as Egyptian but he was a Hebrew and um, then he um, discovered the Egyptians mistreating the Hebrews and he uh, beat and killed the Egyptian slave driver and, and had to go into hiding when he discovered the burning bush and um, God um, spoke to him and then he went back to free the uh, Israelites from the Egyptians um, <coughs> with magical pl plagues and um, they crossed the Red Sea and uh, came to Mount Sinai where uh, Moses was given the Ten Commandments and um, they wandered the desert for 40 years and uh, before finally coming to uh, the promised land of Canaan. Um, <coughs> obviously the first thing to wonder is did Moses actually exist? Um, once again um, the texts we have written down are believed to be written down very centuries and centuries later and although stories can go word of mouth there's every probability that there is a legend and myth in these things since uh, it is long before we even have any evidence for the Israelite people existing let alone the kingdom uh, uh, the kingdoms of Israel and Judah um, <coughs> so pinch of salt really um, <coughs> there's no actual evidence really of an exodus of, of Israelites wandering around the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years. There's no evidence of this whatsoever and um, <coughs> though there are some interesting things that happened with regards to Egypt and Canaan during the time that the exodus I suppose is supposed to have happened. Um, one of these is of course the Hyksos. Uh, these were people from Can Se Semite people from Canaan who settled in Egypt and actually had a dynasty in Egypt um, before you know the establishment of the new kingdom in Egypt drove them out um, so there's that and then there's also the fact that uh, shortly after that uh, during the early period of the new kingdom Egypt actually expanded its borders and took over parts of Canaan um, <coughs> and that uh, during the time when Egypt was reigning over Canaan there was a pharaoh called Akhenaten who was a bit of an iconoclast um, and uh, dispensed with mo most of the Egyptian gods worshipping only one god which was the uh, sun, the winged sun disc uh, uh, called Aten um, <coughs> and um, yeah he did all these reforms and uh, the Egyptians wasn't very popular with most Egyptians and future pharaohs re-established the original gods of Egypt and um, uh, tried to deface his statues and everything so um, <coughs> Uh, that happened and it was actually over time after Akhenaten the Egyptians actually lost control over Canaan and became just Egypt again so this is all very interesting um, <coughs> I can't help but wonder whether some of these events are actually there in the ex Exodus story in a kind of restructured kind of way that uh, the people of Israel remembered some of these events and that the whole Hyksos thing might have inspired some of it and that, um, that uh, it's very possible that Akhenaten's um, reforms, which were perhaps the earliest form of monotheism in the entire world, uh, did actually inspire some of the Canaanites, um, who would later become Israelites, to um, adopt a form of monotheism themselves, which may be the beginnings of the Israelite religion. And if this change in religious perspective for them, then very soon afterwards the Egyptians power over Canaan faded, um, they may indeed have viewed it as they were delivered from out of Egypt by <laughs> um, belief in this new god. So there may be all those sorts of elements at the heart of the Exodus story on some level. I've heard of other metaphorical interpretations of the Exodus story. Um, I think in the Jesus Mysteries they mentioned this, but it's also quite a common idea 
anyway that the crossing of the Red Sea is sort of like baptism but it is that uh, there's this thing about being baptized by water by air and by fire and it is interesting to note that uh, once they encounter um, God on, on Mount Sinai there's then a pillar of, of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that, that guides them through the wilderness uh, that's all there in the in the uh, text so um, there is this interesting water air fire thing um, so that's an interesting idea but anyway <coughs> I mean, so many elements in this story are clearly mythical in nature. The whole uh, baby in the uh, basket, in the bulrushes or whatever, it does mimic a story about Horus, a, the Egyptian god Horus, being placed in a basket uh, during his uh, his infancy. Um, that is a myth in Egyptian mythology as well. So, I mean, which came first? I don't know, but uh, uh, it wouldn't be the first time that the writers of the Old Testament have been inspired by uh, stories from other cultures um, and yeah obviously the whole waving the staff thing like a, a magic wand and <laughs> the uh, plagues of, of locusts and boils and frogs and rivers of turning to blood and <laughs> darkness and all this stuff um, yeah this is we are in the territory of myth telling on some level I think here um, <clears throat> It's interesting to note that, of course, play, that many of these things would have been natural disasters that would have been quite common from time to time, um, such as locusts and things. Um, uh, apparently, the rivers, the River Nile turning red is, uh, I mean, it's not literally blood, but that is something that happens as well. So, um, from minerals or something. Um, and it can cause fish and stuff to die. I've, I've heard of this thing. Anyway. Um, <coughs> so, there can be some um, observations of natural plagues that would actually beset uh, Egypt. Uh, in all this, but uh, obviously the construction of this story, the way it's constructed, is a uh, mythical telling uh, of, on some level. Uh, obviously before uh, the whole let my people go and the plagues and everything, uh, Moses, an outcast from Egypt, um, he obviously encountered the burning bush, uh, very famously, and then you get that thing where God announces that his name is I Am, <laughs> or I Am What I Am. Um, yeah, the translation I've got uh, says I am who I am in the text but then the footnotes says it could also be I am what I am or I will be what I will be so clearly the exact form of the verb to be is variable here um, so it could be any form of the verb to be I'm interested in the fact that I mean whenever the Bible translates as Lord in capital letters it is always um, the, the, the name YHWH uh, uh, which can mean uh, the verb to be. <laughs> um, and I wonder if it is that I am who I am, is it YHWH. Um, the H bit that's repeated would be the verb to be then, and the W is what, and the Y is I. So I am what am? I am what is? <laughs> um, I do feel this thing when God is said to announce himself as, you know, to say, say, I am sent you. Um, I just wonder, is God saying, I am existence itself? Very deep. Um, it would make sense with a monotheist thing. This God is existence itself. What interests me is it's like, uh, it's kind of a bit pantheist, like God is existence. <laughs> Not he created everything that exists, but he is existence itself. Um, I like that. As a bit of a pantheist inclined person, I do like that a lot. Um, <coughs> yes, the Ten Commandments, the whole Mount Sinai thing. Was Mount Sinai a volcano? It might have been. It certainly seems to be depicted as that way with the clouds and the smoke and the fire and the smoke and everything. Uh, it seems very like a volcano. Uh, very unlikely that literally someone went up onto a volcano then without getting severely harmed. I mean, if it was erupting, but I suppose maybe it was sleeping and it was just making smoke. I don't know, but <laughs> anyway, comes down with the Ten Commandments. Um, it is interesting to note in the story that the whole um, that this uh, immediately follows a thing where Moses is struggling with all the demands of the people. Uh, it's, it's stressful. It's demanding his time and his attention all the time. Everyone comes up with him with little complaints they have about stuff. He's basically got to be the ruler of these all these people, and um, it's stressful. And um, his. Uh, Jethro, who had been staying with before around the time of the burning bush thing, um, who was visiting at the time, suggested to him maybe you should uh, basically have other people 
acting as, as go-betweens uh, to do all the trivial things. So only the very important things come to you, basically as a way to, you know, make it, because all this stuff can't fall on the shoulders of one person. And um, <coughs> it's following that that you get the whole Ten Commandments. So there's the thing, if there are these laws, because um, it's not just the Ten Commandments, it was given other laws on that uh, mountain top. But yeah, here's the thing, of now there are guidelines from, so other people can know what these guidelines are and can uh, deal with a lot of the petty disputes for me. And so uh, there's that connection to that whole thing, which is quite interesting. Uh, the Ten Commandments themselves, I've, everybody knows them. Um, <laughs> uh, <coughs> the first two deal with the, uh, yeah, you should have no other god but me, and then there's the whole not making idols thing. Which obviously, you know, it's the Israelites setting themselves apart from a lot of the polytheist cultures around them. Everyone knows the Ten Commandments. I don't know what there is to say much about that to us. Um, <coughs> Um, which, I mean, and you get the whole story with the golden calf, but again, that's, um, I mean, this is the foundation stones of the whole Israelite uh, religion, isn't it? The whole Jewish religion. And then you get the whole book of Leviticus, which is full of all these laws. There's a lot of stuff about animal sacrifice in there as well, but um, there's a lot of all these kinds of laws. Many of them seem strange by today's standards, like not having tattoos and not eating prawns and stuff. And it makes me wonder why people... Uh, focus so much on that notorious bit in Leviticus about uh, you should not lie with a man as you would with a woman or whatever, if that's what it means, because it is actually very unclear as to how it is exactly to interpret it. It's like you know, don't lie lyings with a woman or something. It's not. <laughs> I've, I don't know what the literal interpretation is of those words. There does seem to be some debate over what it's really talking about. Uh, in any case, you can easily say it's more about anal sex than it is about homosexuality per se. Uh, which does fit into the whole purity laws. There's lots of stuff in Leviticus about skin diseases and, you know, a lot of dietary um, restrictions, which, I mean, you can't help but think that uh, is to do with, uh, on some level anyway, about not um, getting disease. But, uh, I don't know, stuff about touching dead bodies and stuff as well. So it does seem to be a concern. Um, <laughs> a hygiene hygiene concern perhaps, uh, it does seem to be uh, what is called purity laws and so if it is that it could well be anal sex and, uh, specifically rather than homosexuality per se but anyway. Uh, I'm going to mention again here how different parts, a lot of scholars these days tend to think that uh, different parts of the uh, Pentateuch were written at different times. Uh, the basic narrative seems to be the first one. Um, there's stuff like what's in Leviticus, the very ritualistic kind of stuff, does seem to be a lot later. Um, and then there's a sort of in the between stage, uh, which is pretty much the book of Deut Deuteronomy, um, forms part of a historical narrative of the Israelite people um, that goes through Joshua and Judges and Samuel and Kings. Um, the Deuteronomy is like the first part of that, and it was all written down about the same time. Numbers uh, seems to be Exodus part two. Uh, some of it's ritualistic, or um, some of it contains more laws, and some of it contains things like how many, you know, numbers of, of, of people and blah blah blah. And some of it is narrative stuff, like the I said, Exodus Part Two. Um, <laughs> it contains st stuff about um, uh, manna, you know, bread coming down from heaven and um, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, this is obviously all very important stuff for the whole establishment of the whole Jewish uh, Israelite tradition and religion on which of course Christianity and Islam are based as well um, the whole beginning of, of, of this uh, religious tradition and very important for that reason um, and obviously that's the main point of it being written down really I mean it's the, it's the Israelite people saying this is our tradition and our religion I actually rather like the book of Deuteronomy it's uh, for some reason, something about the style it's written in, but it is basically one long sermon that uh, Moses gives about all the stuff and um, about how we're going into the promised land and this is the kind of way that we need to live and but there's some spiritual stuff about putting yourself right with God and everything as well and it's a, uh, I don't know, it's a very engaging read, I mean <laughs> whatever you think about it, it's a very engaging read, I, something, I like the style of Deuteronomy for some reason I can't quite explain, but anyway, anyway I don't know what more to say about the Exodus um, it probably never literally happened, but it probably refers to the sense in which um, the Canaanite people that the Israelites descended from were under the yoke of Egyptians for a while, and then they broke free of the yoke of the Egyptians for a while, and this was all around the same sort of time as when Akhenaten introduced monotheism to the world, and that may have inspired these uh, Canaanites who became Israelites later to 
become monotheists themselves. And and so there's a sense in which we you know, we found God and it, it delivered us from Egypt. And I think that's the basis behind it. And then it's all like these are this is our religious tradition and the way we set ourselves apart from other people. Are, you know, we're not like the the polytheists and hedonists around us. We have strict uh, moral guidelines and strict um, religious <laughs> monotheism and uh, little ritualistic things like we don't eat pork and stuff, which actually is the most um, signifying thing that distinguishes early Israelites from Canaanites, according to archaeologists, is that uh, in Israelite settlements we don't have pig bones. So it may be the earliest thing that was different about the Israelites was that they didn't eat pork, interestingly. Um, <coughs> but uh, there you are. What else is there to say? <laughs> um, so we're all different, we're all special. Snowflakes unite, and thanks for watching.